All right, let's talk a little bit about memory management in Chapter 3. So this will be the first of, uh, I think, a couple of videos here on talking about memory management. And we'll take on from a little bit of what we talked about last week in CPU scheduling, um, add on a couple more algorithms. And some of these algorithms I want you to pay attention to because I, I know that they show up in different forms in different places, you know, as, as you start to grow through development and you know maybe you're using a java bus architecture for something or some problem comes up in a docker container and kubernetes is an example so um as we talk about these i you know i think yes you need to understand how they um, affect things down at an operating system level but you know rare is it that many of us are going to go write an operating system or modify an operating system and change things so um but that's not to say that we wouldn't use uh, you know a thousand different operating systems together in some form of a distributed system that um, could act the same way and we could still run into the same kind of problem so I, I just as we hit those I just want you to think about that a little bit okay so <clears throat> you know interesting uh, to think about you know Parkinson's law here you know programs expand to fill the memory available to hold them okay well great I can I can hear that, I can read that, I can remember it, I can write it down on a test, but what does it mean? Um, it really means the fact, and, and we'll learn this, uh, that a program is not necessarily always pulled into memory, but if there is available memory, and as things, uh, you know, as we see the algorithms of how we deal with, with memory, um, you know, progress, we will see that, you know, it's just the natural uh, habit of, of it doing that, which isn't a bad thing. Um, and, and what will understand the difference between virtual memory, physical memory, uh, which are, you know, pages and frames that then, uh, you know, kind of get us in that mode of thinking of um, bringing, you know, program and data into memory uh, versus, you know, kind of pretending they are. So obviously this is true and, and things will fill it up. Um, I, I would say if you're trying to akin this a little to Moore's law, thinking about, you know, the, you know, the doubling, um, you know, that um, we've now got to a point where I think, you know, any given PC with, you know, 16 to 32 gigs of RAM, uh, us as users have not <laughs> kept up with that and need that much uh, space. But, um, you know, I'll tell you, when you start to, you know, get into virtual spaces and you start carving up servers, yeah, definitely, um, you know, that becomes an issue. Um, I would say that, you know, we kind of hit some interesting times about 10 years ago when uh, memory became very cheap and uh, grew at an exponential rate. And then we started to have all these new kinds of, you know, different forms of, let's say, memory. Um, we had uh, flash memory. We had, which, are, you know, we're in cameras. And then we kind of moved to, you know, other forms of um, USB, which is a little slower, but, you know, uh, lots of ways to kind of almost turn that into a hard drive, um, you know, and then we had, you know, some of the uh, chip versions in, in different formats of, you know, things that can get up into very large spaces. And again, you know, you might see those more in cameras or um, cell phones than anywhere else. But yes, we have um, grown, you know, probably way more than 10,000 times now um, back then. Uh, the, the one t thing I always remember is I think it was Apollo 11 or 13, um, but that entire computer for a spaceship that went to the moon had 1K of memory. So 1K, not mag, not gig, 1K, so 1,000 bytes of memory. And the 1,000 bytes of memory was actually wire-wrapped, and which was, you know, consumed the entire wall behind the, uh, um, where the astronauts sat. So you think of that, and that was, you know, 69, so um, that was 1K. Uh, obviously, we've come quite a quite a distance from there, but um, we've also kind of, you know, and again, to kind of bring in Moore's Law more than anything, you know, as we kind of look to double, um, you know, our, our compute capacity. I think when we started distributed systems probably 10, 15 years ago, depending on if those file systems or other systems, um, we kind of started to bend the need for uh, different things to grow. Um, networks needed to grow more than anything bandwidth and speed um, latency had to go down um, connectivity had to go up um, but you know CPUs didn't really have you know, we didn't have a need to make them grow as much as we we had in the past so things change a little bit and things morph around but you know for memory's sake uh, yeah so we, we did grow so if 
we have a DOS operating system, which is kind of this idea. Um, the, the, the thing that kind of you think about is, uh, you know, if I don't have any abstraction, if I just use memory for memory's sake, I actually plug things in at very specific parts of memory. And I remember, you know, backloading DOS, I think it was up to 640 bytes. So it's 0 to 640 was, I think, where the OS went. And then you had above 1024 is where the user stuff went. And I think there was, you know, even initially there was a hole between that 640 and the 1024. And then somebody wrote some software or firmware to let you consume that whole whatever, 380 or whatever it was. Um, so interesting times. But this is just kind of that idea of thinking of um, using memory directly. Um, but you got to think about how they work. And so if you think of the first one there on the left of A, you've got, you know, kind of that, you know, you got an operating system running, which is, you know, somewhere in memory. Um, and is that a single process or a multiple process? So is it more like DOS where it's just kind of overlaying? Um, or are you looking at, you know, kind of a A or B where, you know, do you put the OS at the high order of memory at the low order? Um, and, you know, again, this is physical. Um, but then, you know, where do I put all my other stuff? I can see where do I put my device drivers and all the other things, you know, shared shared memory and libraries and all the other things that I still need to make my, my system work. So ways to think about it, but we don't have to worry about this because we don't do it this way. Um, we also think about um, how programs kind of run through um, memory, how they get allocated, where they go. And so... Um, I'm not seeing it here, but kind of, you know, this is kind of more of a, a slab style um, where you're giving, you know, chunks of memory out um, and you know that every instruction and every um, thing that gets done and where the data sits um, is all based on, you know, certain forms of, um, you know, blocks of, of data or slabs, if you want to call them that. Um, so, you know, looking at, at, you know, A and B, you know, it could be the, the current instruction is at zero and then kind of where you're asking it to, to work um, could be in that data form as well. Um, where in C, I think it's a little different in that, you know, you're kind of saying, okay, um, you know, maybe I'm going to a certain level, but I need to jump up a certain amount. And we'll see this in a second. And this is actually kind of this whole idea of base and, and limits. Um, so you can move around a lot easier if, if you've got easier numbers to deal with instead of trying to address every, you know, single bit and byte of memory by itself. <clears throat> so, the idea of having this base register and knowing that, you know, for you as a process, you start at 16384, and when you then say jump 28, you're saying 28 plus 16384, which gets you up to 16412. So, just a different model of, of how to think about it, and this gives you a little, uh, you know, kind of different kind of glance that if, if maybe a process gets loaded in memory and I don't think about it from that original one where I've just got a little bit of memory, but now I've got a lot of memory. Um, maybe everybody just gets a chunk of memory of what they need and they just deal with everything based on its relative location. Okay. And this is something we'll, that'll come up over and over again, but you know, just kind of keep that idea in mind that um, the one thing we do have to do in memory faster than anything is we have to answer the actual physical address extremely fast. And so we'll talk about virtual memory here in a second, but this whole idea that, you know, how can I say jump 28 because 28 is down here? Well, I have to know where I'm at. And so if I can make a very quick calculation on that and get to that next level, that's kind of the key that we're looking at. <clears throat> Another huge topic in all this is um, swapping. There's a few different ideas behind this. Uh, but mainly it's always about taking something that is a, a running process or a running piece of memory um, and then when it's needed um, to swap out, meaning you're out of memory, um, that you would then go ahead and get that out of memory and then only bring it back in um, when it's needed and then maybe swap something else out. So what this example is kind of showing is if you watch A, A cruises along and then A gets swapped out here because then D needs to be loaded, but then D runs, and then we have to swap out B to bring A back in because it's needed. So it's just this idea of, you know, we call it a back-end store, you know, your hard drive, but um, the, the concept that, um, 
you can only compute something when it's actually in memory. So if you put it out to disk and you and you store it there in, in what's called the swap space, um, which is an actual physical partition on your drive, which is usually two times your RAM, um, plus a meg for some reason, um, then you know it's held out there, but you can't compute anything there, so you have to pull it back in. So there's this whole idea of you know swapping data in and out, and um, you actually can get to a um, kind of a death spiral in a way where if you're spending most of your time swapping data in and out and not actually computing anything, you're probably going to never recover from that and your system's going to crash. So um, we'll talk about this more, um, uh, you know, as we kind of walk down this path. Um, so just another way to look at it. And again, a lot of this comes with, you know, kind of this idea of perfect fit. And so how am I using my memory uh, the best I can? Um, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, best fit, worst fit. Um, sometimes it's just picking a victim and going. Um, so, and again, a lot of it gets back to, back to this concept of um, how fast can I do something. And sometimes picking a victim is a lot easier than trying to sort through, you know, all of your RAM or try to find the best fit or find the, find the whole. We'll talk about all those algorithms coming up here. But, um, you know, looking at, you know, kind of A, uh, knowing that there are, you know, there's room for growth in these different segments. When you get to uh, B, um, you're kind of running out of space. And so what you'll see is that, you know, your room for growth shrinks substantially. And then we start to think about, okay, uh, where are we going to fit the next thing? And, and this could be that we just take all of A and we push it out to the back end store, which is that swap space on your hard drive. Um, but then how do we manage that and pull that back in? We'll talk about that through the rest of the today. Now, I said it twice already and I'll keep saying it. We have to figure out how to basically allocate and man manage memory as fast as we possibly can. So if we ever were to go to the kernel and say, I need uh, 1024 bytes of data or memory um, and I need that allocated to me, that's basically saying that you're going to get some memory allocated from the kernel uh, to you, 1024, you can't, you know, ask for 1024 and get 1023 or less or 1025 or greater, so you get what you asked for. Um, and in doing that, uh, it could be you're out of memory and that just chose a victim and other things happen and, and, you know, and so then that program probably is going to come back and say, well, now I need memory. And does it clobber you and what happens? And we'll talk about all those, but just the simple ask of, of going to the kernel and saying I need 1024 bytes of memory requires it to very quickly figure out where it has 1024 bytes of memory. And so a couple ways to think about it in bitmaps is to look at, you know, a bitmap as it sits there and look for zeros. And so here I know that I could look for, you know, a hole here with three, a hole here for two, a hole here for three. I could also do it in some form of a list where I've got, you know, a process occupied that starts at zero and goes for five. I have a hole that starts at zero, one, two, three, four, five, and goes for three. Um, and then I, what is it, 18, another hole shows up at 18 for two, and then another uh, hole at 29 for three, and then the X just denotes that you're done. So that's a linked list version of how to do it. So regardless of how we figure it out, we have to think of ways to allocate memory as fast as we possibly can. And usually it's, you know, if, if you could do it in, you know, one click of the CPU, one, you know, one spin of, you know, compute, let's call it, um, that's what we're really after. We can't sit there and, you know, kind of take our time hunting and pecking for the most optimal, best possible thing that you could ever find. Because at the end of the day, that's going to take too long. And if memory takes, you know, think about it. If, if you take an algorithm that, that, you know, might take one more step, and you only had one to begin with, that's 50% hit on your on your memory allocation speed. And that's not something we can deal with. So we have to come up with very quick, easy ways to make this happen. Um, this is just what a link list would look like, you know, before X terminates, after, before, after, so on and so forth. So um, just that idea that, um, you know, as a process kind of goes away, what it kind of looks like. Now, the thing that's interesting is it's not showing you that A then links to B, 
A now links to nothing, and B then links to nothing. So you know, what's missed here in the fact that it's a linked list is this is a hole, but it's a logical hole now. It's not a physical hole. You're not putting that hole really in memory directly right there. So let's, let's talk a little bit about memory management. And we talked about these before, and they kind of, you know, we talked about a CPU scheduler, and it's still kind of the same kind of problems we run into. Um, <clears throat> let's say I need that 1024. I could ask the question of all of these and say, do I find the first one, this 1024? Well, that makes a lot of sense because I don't care. Um, you know, it's, it's not that, you know, this RAM is better than that RAM or it runs faster than other RAM. So there's no affinity or need to find anything like that. But what if that wasn't 1024? It just had 1024 available, but there was, you know, um, you know, 3106. So now I've, I've kind, of, kind of made this uh, fragmentation issue kind of a, a big deal now. Um, next fit. So the kind of idea that, you know, um, it's maybe not the first, but it's the next one. So, you know, interesting, but why why spend that extra cycle? Um, best fit? Uh, that's great, uh, but um, you're just slowing down the whole fragmentation issue, and with best fit, you have to know where the best one is. And that's a lot of compute time. Um, worst fit is just an interesting one to think about because is worst fit actually better than best fit? Just saying that, you know, if, if the worst fit out of 1024 would be, you know, 52,000, you know, I, I just had this crazy open space. Well, maybe it makes most sense to just start filling that thing up, even though it's, it's not really what's needed. Um, quick fit or sort fit or, you know, there's all these other ones to think about. But, you know, as we think about all these different forms of memory, we have to think about... You know, how do we allocate it out there, um, knowing that there will always be kind of two things. And we, we won't talk about these directly until, I think, file systems, but this whole concept of internal and external fragmentation. Internal fragmentation is if you take anything that is more than of a, a, an atomic unit. So let's say we grab uh, 1024 bytes of data. Are you going to use all 1024? And if you don't, you have internal fragmentation. Let's say I grabbed that 1024, but then I left, uh, you know, 48 bytes of memory sitting in that free space. Well, I got this little teeny nothing space that I probably won't use ever because nobody really ever says I just need 48 bytes. So that's external fragmentation, which is the space between the blocks. So we'll talk about that more when we get down to there. Okay, so we can't really rely on, you know, this whole concept of, uh, you know, kind of hitting the kernel all day long with all these memory requests. So we need some way to kind of create a different space for us in our programs when they run. And the other problem that comes in is, you know, back in, uh, you know, 69, 70, 71, let's say, where you had between a K and a meg of mem memory, you know, just a, a process by itself running might take two megs. So did we just wait for, you know, RAM to keep up? Or catch up or you know what did we do well we had to create this virtual memory which is kind of a way to tell the operating system yeah no everything's fine you know and, well, sure we got it all but we don't so we not that we're lying to it but it's just we're we're telling it that um, everything is there and it's where it needs to be and only when we hit that thing that we really need do we actually go get it so we take the actual hit when we have to so, you know, it, it's kind of that concept of, you know, I'm saying everything's perfectly done, but only if you notice it isn't done will I actually go do the work. So, um, so we think of, um, and we're going to kind of use these terms interchangeably, but um, virtual memory is, you know, each program has its own address space. So, you know, again, you could think of everything starting at zero now because, you know, everything, you know, would fit nicely that way and it's just easier for you know as humans to think about it that way but the other thing is that it's broken up into chunks called pages so physical memory has frames and virtual memory has pages now we need a way to map all this that is extremely fast okay so <clears throat> even if I you know create this whole virtual memory space and I say that you know meh you know, everything starts at zero and everything's good. Well, that's all great, but you still have to still go to the real 
memory because you can't do anything in the fake space. So we, we do have to map to it. And one of the ways that that happens is some form of an MMU um, or some logic or some, you know, some other thing that might do that. Sometimes these are embedded um, directly into the CPU. Sometimes they're, um, you know, next to or close to that, you know, kind of almost in the cache of, um, of you know, where the registers and everything else are in the CPU. But the, the goal of the MMU is as fast as possible to go take that virtual address and look up its real physical address. And that way, go then use it at that location. Many ways to do it. <clears throat> we could do simple just physical mapping. Uh, problem with that mapping, and this is taking 4K um, kind of slabs or chunks or blocks, however you want to think about it, um, as virtual pages, and then map them to their actual frame. Now, this is fine if all you have is 64K of memory because you have very few to deal with and it's easy to manage and you've got a small table and it's easy to look up but what happens when you get to 32 gig you know it, it, it isn't manageable this way so we'll, we'll see different forms of tables and hierarchies and ways to kind of manage things and you know sometimes it's two or three or four or n level um, tables but we, we need a way to look this up as fast as we possibly can but the problem will always be there and this is not a memory thing. This is this is a memory thing. It's a hard drive thing. It's a block storage thing. It's a scaling issue all across the board. Is usually when and, and I always kind of go back to encyclopedias. Encyclopedias, you know, for those who've never seen them, are the stack of books that's usually eight to ten feet long when you when you put them up on the shelf, and they start from A and they're all labeled. And some of them might span two books, so you might have you know, B to BR and then BR to BZ or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's it's before, uh, you know, the Internet was out there. It was our way to kind of look stuff up. Now, Encyclopedia has had a couple things going for them. One is uh, there's only so much information you would put in them. So um, if I was to go look up uh, Brontosaurus, um, I would go to the BR and I would know that, well, if this one went up to BR, I'll grab the other one, but it's probably got to be in the front because it's B-R-O and, you know, and I could thumb through it and find it pretty quick. Now, let's say I took that entire encyclopedia set and I threw all the pages up in the air and they all landed on the ground. And then I said, okay, go find Brontosaurus. <laughs> well, uh, luck of the draw, right? Um, we, could, we could come up with all the algorithms we want. And we could say, well, I'm going to start with, you know, grabbing pages. And, you know, I could say I got, you know, N over 2 or, you know, you know O to the whatever and, you know, we can come up with all these, you know, luck of the draw kind of things. But the reality is, is that as things get larger and larger, we need different ways to go find things fast. And because this is a small table, it's easy to look up this way. But when we see big tables, we got to do it differently. <clears throat> um, this one really is looking at, um, you know, an MMU with, you know, again, a very small set of, um, pages, you know, it's, a, it's only 16 of these 4K. Um, and what this is doing is it's actually building the uh, memory address on the fly. So it's taking the virtual address and kind of mapping it. And then depending on, you know, if you look at the first one here, um, this first one maps to the number two, which is 110, which goes up here. And then um, because that's a one, that's good. Um, it's valid and it takes the rest and kind of builds it on there. So there are ways to, you know, kind of deal with, you know, offsets and things at a, a small bit level. Uh, but again, this is only 16 memory segments. So when you get to, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, this becomes a little hard to deal with. Now, <clears throat> we can think of these, um, you know, ways to set up data like this in so many different ways. Um, this is actually, if you were to go look at um, network protocols and how we do network programming, um, this could be referenced almost the same way as a TCP and IP header. Um, we can look at this in ways of um, time division multiplexing and all these different things. So it's just ways to think about, okay, when I have something that I want to represent, 
I might have bits that represent metadata or, you know, even in a file system, this could be the inode where this is the actual data. This is actually just referencing a page frame number. So um, kind of gets you the idea of, um, you know, kind of the, I don't know, not permission bits around it, but, you know, some of the controlling characteristics of it. So, you know, is it read, write, you know, has it been modified, is caching disabled, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of this, when we'll see it here, comes down to zeros and ones because those are the easiest things to just look at and say yes, no, um, and move on. Um, other things are a little more complex in how we have to kind of then, you know, maybe map, map a few things together to get to, uh, you know, true or false. But, um, you know, just a simple example of that. So, speeding up paging, well, the biggest problem is, is, you know, how big your tables are. You know, if you've got 32 gigs of RAM, those are big tables. And mapping between the two doesn't change uh, based on that scale. So you can't say that, you know, a virtual table stays constant when the, you know, physical table gets so big. Uh, because they have to map together. They both have the same limitations. The thing that's interesting about virtual, though, is, um, and I think I've shown it to you on my machine before, you know, I show that in my virtual memory I'm using... I don't know what it was, 238 gigs uh, of virtual memory. Well, or no, I'm sorry, it was it was 2.3 uh, terabytes of, of memory, and I only have a 512 gig drive and 16 gigs of memory, so that doesn't work. So a lot of this is just kind of, you know, math uh, and, and things that might be held there. But I still need to be able to figure out that if I ever want to use one of those crazy addresses, that it actually points to something that is real. Now, this is an interesting one because um, there's this whole kind of thought around, and so this whole, you know, if you take these words apart, right? So the translation look aside buffer, look aside is kind of the key here. So it's kind of saying, you know, let's go look at things that have been kind of recently used and see if they're, you know, we can just get a quick, easy hit on it. Because maybe it's not that, you know, we can always have, you know, 16 page table entries, you know, and, and that's worth anything. But let's think about, you know, when we compute something and when a program is actually running in memory, maybe that thing uses that same memory over and over and over again for, you know, 50 cycles or, you know, or, you know 50 things at a time and then goes away. Well, if that thing's sitting right next to something that I, I just did or, you know, not not next to it, but I mean, it, it was something that, that just happened. If I could find that quickly and move move on, great. So it, it's kind of, I don't want to say a, a cache kind of thing, but I mean, it's it, it's kind of this idea that says, well, you know, if it was just recently used, maybe it'll be used again. So maybe we look there first. And so this whole idea would be to say, um, if there's a hit, then it is something that I can look up very, very quickly and if there's a miss, then fine. I'm going to go take that longer time to go find the whole thing. And regardless, one of these is going to fill this in. I'm going to take, you know, my actual, you know, address from there. And those two together point to my physical memory. So it's just a, you know, another cool algorithm around that. Now, this is what I was talking about before. And we'll see this over and over and over again. Uh, encyclopedias are a good example of this as well. Um, if everything in the world, um, and there wasn't that many things, started with A, then we'd have one volume, it would be A, and we'd be able to go look everything up pretty quick and everything would be great. Um, that isn't the case, so we have to think about, okay, well, how do we have you know, more of this two-level paging? And two-level paging is, you know, you can almost think of these as encyclopedias where zero is A, one is B, two is C, D, E. And so if I want to go look up cat, I would easily go say cat and it would go to this volume and it would be easier to find. So it, it's just, just a smaller subset. Now, this requires a couple things and this is something that the book doesn't really talk about and, and isn't that obvious, is this stuff has to be in what I'll call logical order. Now, in my encyclopedia example, it's in alphabetical order. That's one form of logical order. In what we're talking about here in actual memory space, what we're saying is that you have to point to a table that then you can look things up faster. So if this was to say, uh, you know, PT1 would be page table one, 
that would point me to where I would go for page table two, and then that would point me to my final destination. That still is a logical set, but we know it's there. Um, this is a very explicit map, basically saying go from one to two to you know the where where the end result is. It's a little different than, than looking up something that's sorted because sorted is um, you know something that we can kind of do the you know divide in half and cut out and you know um, you know kind of the, the O notation kind of. Um, ways to think about but in this one it's really kind of just explicitly kind of stating put it in a smaller table so that smaller table is easier to go kind of run through and find that quick answer what we're not talking about as well is how do you put all this data into these tables so when we start to look at you know let's say we've got a, a table that's 17 uh, tables deep um, you need to manage all the way up that whole thing so you need to touch each one of those. And is that cost now going to be so great that it's going to kind of get rid of the value of anything you would have been doing in that space? So inverted page tables, just another algorithm of, again, how we would do that. So the idea um, where, again, I take in my virtual space my page number and then <clears throat> pass the offset directly across and then really look at you know, any form of unique identifier. Um, so in this example, I could pull this through um, and based on my page number, kind of find that, you know, search. So how far I go down and find that and then plug that I kind of back in here. So it, it's just another way to kind of think about, you know, an algorithm uh, that gets me to my end result but again, gets me there faster. So if you go back to simple sorting rules and, and thinking about how long it takes to sort something, how long it takes to insert something, how long it takes to look things up, um, we're doing that now with memory addresses, but how could we do it where a virtual memory address could identify the markers to get me to that thing faster? And that's, this is just, again, one example to get, to get there. So I'm gonna pause this one here and start this one as, uh, the second, second recording.